Good to see you today. Thank you for being with us. We're at Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina. I'm Butch Howard, and we're right in the middle of our study series, Spiritual Dominions. Spiritual Dominions are the unseen power brokers of our time, our world. The Bible speaks a lot about spiritual power. Often in our uh, humanness, we process everything in the visible material world realm, and we fail to understand, and many people fail to acknowledge the existence of the spiritual dominions. We say that in the plural form because there's more than one. The first passage we looked at several weeks ago, the book of Ephesians tells us there are principalities and there are powers there is spiritual wickedness in high places. So this spiritual realm, these spiritual dominions are at work manipulating and uh, controlling how humans uh, do life in this world. We have talked about a number of these. Uh, if you remember uh, last week, we talked about uh, the Holy Spirit versus the flesh and how that worked, the Holy Spirit is to be dominant. He's to rule in our lives. He lives in us. He guides us. He empowers us. And he rules over us. And today we're going to talk about spiritual light versus spiritual darkness. It's another realm or dominion in the spiritual world. If you can see it that way, as a dominion, as a realm of power within the spiritual Realm. Today we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll be looking at several intriguing passages of Scripture today. And I was just uh, talking to our Heavenly Father before uh, the recording today and asking Him to help us understand. This is probably one of the most important biblical truths there is anywhere in the Scripture. If we do not understand the difference between spiritual light and spiritual darkness, we are never going to be able to live joy-filled, peaceful, overcoming, fulfilling lives, the abundant life Jesus says that we should have. So it's uh, an important principle today as we look in the Scriptures. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we look at the Word as we receive the word and understand it. Father, we love you today. Thank you for loving us. We realize more every single day how utterly unworthy we are of even your smallest kindness. And yet Jeremiah says your mercies are new every morning. We awaken to a new supply each day, and for that we are thankful. Today, Father, as we Look into this new realm of spiritual light versus spiritual darkness. Would you open the eyes of our heart and enable us to understand the scriptures that will be before us? I'm asking, Lord, that those who watch and listen be able to receive from your Holy Spirit the truth that we need in these very dark and difficult days in which we live. The darkness, the spiritual darkness, is intensifying all around us. And there is but one remedy for darkness, and that's light. So, Father, would you help us today from your holy word? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the Apostle Paul was writing a letter. Actually, this is his first letter to the believers at Thessalonica, and he was writing on a series of areas of concern that the church had uh, in chapter 4, the preceding chapter. There was a, a deep concern regarding this teaching of the return of Christ, and he explained for us we have the beautiful revelation of the rapture event, the harpezo, the catching away of believers uh, and then the dead rising uh, in the fourth chapter. In chapter 5, he gets back to the issues of those who are alive and remain. We want to pick up with the fourth verse of this fifth chapter today. 
He says, but ye brethren are not in darkness. Now, time out for a second. He uses the word brethren so we know that he's referring to believers. He's not, but he's not calling the Thessalonians brethren because he was a Jew from the Middle East. He was definitely not a biological brother. He was not a uh, racial brother, but he was a spiritual brother in Christ. So he uses this word brother, meaning we're talking about believers here in this portion he said, ye are not in darkness. That, that day, speaking of the day we just read about in the fourth chapter, the day of the rapture event, would take you, overtake you as a thief. He says, ye are all the children of light. Everyone who is a believer there in Thessalonica are children of the light and the children of the day. We are not, circle that word, we are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Paul has drawn a line here. He's made a difference between the believers and the unbelievers. He has labeled the believers children of the day children of the light. The unsaved, the unbelievers, are children of the night and of the darkness. So now in verse 6, he says what is perfectly natural for those who are awake and in the daytime. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. That's the normal time for sleeping. And they that be drunken are drunken at night. More sin, more carousing, more evil happens after nightfall. Verse 8, but let us, again including himself, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet, the hope, of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 9 is a, is a proof verse that the church will not go into the tribulation period. But we're going to call time out right there for a moment on this passage. The truth that needs to be seen here is that Paul sees two realms at work simultaneously dominions, if you will. He sees the light and he sees the darkness. These are domains. We know that when the light is shining, darkness can't stay around. Darkness flees. When the darkness takes over, there is no light. So these are separate entities. They're different dominions at work. So let's go, go, as you see on the screen, to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And look at verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Those who are of the darkness are reserved unto the day of punishment. Now, we have to understand that those who are in darkness are in darkness because of deception. Uh, let's go quickly uh, before we get into 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 9. Let's, well, let's, let's go there first. Chapter 2 of 1 Peter and verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We're coming up on the phrase we want to see, that you should so show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We saw in 2 Peter 2 and verse 9 the condemnation of those who were in darkness. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 
says to you and I who are believers that we have been called out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Second Corinthians chapter uh, 4 here is a, is a very important passage. Uh, there are so many scriptures on light and darkness in the New Testament that it's really, uh, it's quite impossible to, to cover them all in the time uh, in the time that we have here. But uh, look at verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, he says this, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now there's two reasons why the gospel would be hidden to humanity. One is they've been blinded, and that's the word he uses here. The other is the gospel has been shrouded in darkness. So let's look. The, world, uh, the uh, God of this world, Satan, hath blinded the eyes of them which believe not, lest the light, circle that word, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Now watch very carefully here. Those who refuse to believe are blind. It doesn't matter to a blind person whether it's daylight or dark. They can't see, not because of the absence of light or the presence of darkness, but because they are blind. There are, are people in this world, to use Peter's terminology, who are willfully ignorant of the truth. And Paul says in chapter 1 of Romans, they have intentionally, deliberately changed the truth of God into a lie. So they're blinded. They're deceived. They have placed themselves in this dominion of spiritual darkness. So now for you and I who were light, we will talk about us first. It's very important, and there's several scriptures here, as you see on the screen, that are very, very important. Uh, he has called us out of darkness into his light, which means this. Child of God, there was a time before you were saved, that you were just like every other unsaved person alive today. You were in the dominion of darkness. Darkness ruled your life. You could not see spiritual truth. You could not understand spiritual things. You were in the realm, the dominion of spiritual darkness. When God saves us, the light of Jesus, who is the light of the world, shines into our hearts. And his light, the Bible says, is as the glory of the sun. So when the precious son of God shines his light into us, the darkness has to, 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 to flee. It can't abide. It is impossible for the darkness to remain. And so now we have been made children of the light. So let's go over to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. And look at the ninth verse here. 1 John chapter 4 verse 9. And this was manifested or revealed the love of God toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him, that we might live through him. Now, there are two things when we think about the person of Jesus Christ. And First John chapter 1, uh, rather, the gospel of John chapter 1 says this. We'll go there in just a minute. But when Jesus comes into our lives, two things happen. Our dead spirit is resurrected and made alive. So Jesus provides spiritual Life. The second thing that happens when Jesus comes in is he illuminates, he brings with him spiritual light. Let's go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. I hope you're able to keep up with me today, but these scriptures are immensely important to our understanding of the spiritual domains that are at work in our world. Now watch what he says now. Verse 4, we're talking about Jesus here. In him was life, 
This is not mortal life. This is not human life. This is the life of God. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended. It couldn't restrict it. Comprehended it not. Now, John is going to come on the scene, John the Baptist. He was not that light in verse 8, but the true light in verse 9. Look, that was the true light. Notice, if you've got a King James Bible, the word light is capitalized. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So, Jesus Christ brings into us who believe both his life as well as his light. So now we exist in him. One of the most profound passages in all the Bible is found in the book of Acts. And you see it on the screen here, chapter 17. I know we're running through a lot of scriptures. I hope that you're able to write them down. If not, uh, rewind it, start it over, uh, get this down in your heart and mind. But in Acts chapter 17, Jesus is saying some very powerful things to us through the lesson today, and we do not want to miss them. In the 28th verse of the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church, verse 28, I hope you mark your Bible. This is a verse to mark. Paul says, for in him, in whom? In Christ we live and move and have our being. Now, that's a powerful statement because what he's saying is we exist in Christ. You and I today are inhabitants of planet Earth. This is our dominion. This is our habitat. We live and move, physically speaking, in this Earth. And, of course, the address then moves to what portion of the earth we're living in, but we live in the world. The spiritual man that is in us doesn't live in the world. The spiritual man in us, that one that Jesus has saved and redeemed by his blood, the soul and spirit, the inner man, our habitat is Jesus. Paul says, in him we live. In him we move, and in him we have our being. We exist in him. Now, because of that, now follow me carefully. Because we exist, we live and move and have our being in Jesus, we live in the light. We live in the light. When we go to Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we read about the new Jerusalem. One of the elements there of Revelation telling us what this new Jerusalem is like, it says it has no need of the sun nor of the moon, for God is the light thereof. So hear me. Being in Christ means that our life is completely illuminated by the person of Jesus who is our light and our life, okay? Now listen, this is as Jesus intended it to be. This was the plan from the beginning. Matthew chapter 13, and immediately when we mention Matthew 13, we know we're talking about that great parabolic chapter. Uh, there are parables here in this 13th chapter uh, it, is, it is a fascinating study just to take this chapter of parables and begin to look into them and see all the things that Jesus revealed and taught through these parables. But I want you to look at the 43rd verse, Matthew 13 and verse 43. Here's what he says. We have the binding of the, uh, of the, uh, the tares and wheat the tares are bound up, cast into fire. The wheat scattered and put it in the bar. Verse 43, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now watch. 
Revelation tells us that God is the light of the New Jerusalem. That's home to you and I when we leave this world. We abide in Christ, who is the light of the world. That means you and I who were saved are children of the light. We literally are illuminated by God himself, specifically the person of Jesus Christ. He says our radiance is as the sun. So it's important that we understand that I have no light of my own. And you'll notice the, the point at the top of the uh, slide here says reflected light. I have, you have, we, none of us have our own light. We are reflecting the light of Jesus Christ. The best illustration we have of this, and we see it around all of the planets, there are systems, many of the planets have more than one, but planet Earth has one moon. The moon we could not see at all. It has no light of its own. We only see the moon because of the light that's reflected from the sun onto the moon. That's why we can't see the back side of the moon. We can only see the side of the moon that's facing the sun. It's reflected light. So while we're in this world, dear believer, we are reflecting light. We have no light of our own, but we are reflected light. The light that we receive from Jesus and his life in us is our source of light. This is why we don't put confidence in preachers or teachers or religious figures. This is why we don't puff ourselves up and be vaunted in, in our spirituality, but rather we're to be meek and lowly and humble and gentle, preferring one another, giving due respect and submitting one to another in the fear of God. These are the instructions left to us by our Savior. The light we have is real light, but it is not our light. It is not our own. If you see any light in Butch Howard's life, it is light reflected from the Son of God. The people that we have in our church family here at Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, none of us here have any light of our own. Every single believer here is reflected light, and we are reflecting the light of Jesus Christ to the world around us. Everywhere we go, people should see the light and the life of Christ in us. If they are not seeing the light and life of Christ in us, we are failing in our mission. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. We're not to put our light under a bushel. We're not to hide it. We're to shine it because that light is coming directly from him. So we shine by him and we shine for him. That's extremely important. Now, the other side of this equation the spiritual light, this light that's being reflected from the very person of Jesus Christ onto us, the opposite dominion here that's at work, the domain that's at work here is rejected light. Now, please understand, God wants every person to come out of darkness into his marvelous light. He wants every lost person, every deceived person, every sinner to come to faith and salvation, forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus. Some have chosen to reject the light. Now, I want you to go to the book of John. This, of course, is John chapter 3. When you see that address, you immediately know that this is the passage where Jesus is talking to the religious leader, Nicodemus. And it's very interesting here that Jesus carries on this conversation with Nicodemus on a level that Nicodemus should have better understood than he did. 
But he is so plain in this passage. John 3.16 is here. But if you read on down just a little past that very familiar verse, in verse 19, look what he says. And this is the condemnation, or we could say it this way, this is the cause or reason of the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. The light is here. When Jesus came, he was the light. Today, because we share him, we share his message, we share his life, his person, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And the light has come into the world. The fact is, light has shown up. It's come. Watch this. Men loved darkness rather than loving the light. Why? Their deeds are evil. So there is rejected light. Now watch very carefully here. We have a lot of Christians today who are uh, inhibited. They're afraid. They're uh, they're just unwilling to share the gospel with others for uh, a myriad of reasons. But they, at the top of that list is personal rejection. Uh, it, it's wired within us. We want to be accepted. And we must understand that Jesus was not accepted, and we're not going to be either. That's a fact of life. That's a part of the spiritual world that's at work. The spiritual dominions here, light and darkness, means this fact, that those who are in the light will be rejected by those in the darkness. Okay? That's a fact. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. The rejection is of the light itself, the light source itself. So we may expect, we should expect, that because the world rejects Jesus, the great light of the world, they're going to reject us as well. They reject us on the basis of the light that is shining in our lives. It's extremely important that we understand this very, very important concept. Now, as the world intensifies, increases in darkness, and we're seeing it every day, Dear friend, you can't look at the news. You can't, you can't be alive and moving around in our cities, in our communities. You can't go in and out of our schools, our places of business, our government, without seeing the encroaching spiritual darkness. The light is dimming and diminishing because believers are hiding the light of Christ behind all sorts of things. We're fearful to share the light of Jesus for all sorts of reasons. We're just not doing it. So the consequence of refusing to shine our light is the darkness is intensifying. It's taking over. It's getting worse. The only remedy to stop the darkness is to shine the light. That's the only way to cause the darkness to recede. It won't happen at the ballot, at the election in November. We think a new leader will solve our problems. That is blatantly false. It's, it's incredibly wrong to have that mindset. It's not about the politics. It's not about the economics. It's not even about the culture. It's about the soul of man. Men love darkness rather than light. Why? He says it here. Verse 19, their deeds are evil. So Jesus made a statement that should cause shivers to go down our spine. In the same book of John, he makes this statement. We must work for the day while the day is at hand. For the night comes when no man can work. Now, if we read that just at face value, it says this. There's coming a day when the light, the spiritual light, will be so inhibited and suppressed that the darkness is going to take over. And it will be so dark we can't do the spiritual work any longer. Jesus asked this question, when the Son of Man comes, 
will he find faith in the earth? Dear child of God, today we're in troubling, difficult times, and it's time that we let our spiritual light shine brightly into the darkness of this world. I hope you'll join us again next week. Until that time, God bless you.